Hello, thank you for attending my talk. Um, I will be sharing all the slides and all the code samples after it. Uh, you will find all the links. So don't worry if you miss something, you always have the chance to catch up. So I will be talking today about something called Docula, which is our library we built to build type safe backend services with Clojure, HTTP, and Avro. It's a, it's a mouthful, and I'll go deep into all those details, so don't worry about it. So first, I will talk about who I am, why you're listening to me, uh, what is my company doing, how are we using Clojure. There's a bit of a brief history of how our, our system evolved because we had to extract some parts of it, how we do processing and how that's quite nicely split into asynchronous and synchronous processing, what is Docula, how it's designed, what are the features, trade-offs, what we have planned. And after that, I will be more than happy to answer all your questions and and just talk to everybody who, who wants to learn more. So I'm assuming a couple of things that you have some familiarity with building backend services with Clojure, uh, things like Ring, uh, Composure, or other routers, and tiny bit of familiarity with things like Component or Mount or other alternatives. It's just I'm going to be covering a bit more than just the basics. So my name is Lukasz Kolecki. I'm the founder and CTO at EnjoyHQ. Uh, I used to work as a DevOps engineer, write Go, Ruby, PHP, JavaScript, you name it. I've been doing this for over a decade. And for the last five years, I've been running the team, the, the technical team at Enjoy, where we are writing mostly Clojure and TypeScript and a tiny bit of Ruby uh, nowadays. So Enjoy HQ, in a very, very brief uh, one sentence pitch is a UX repository. It allows our customers to upload customer feedback coming from support systems, videos, forwarded emails, survey, survey results, put it all in one place, make it all searchable. It can be highlighted and tagged, put together into research projects, and then summaries of those projects are being shared with the rest of their organization. A good uh, example of that is someone doing a research on a new feature that they want to ship and then interviews customers, gets all their support tickets and puts it in one place and comes up with a conclusion that, yes, the feature is worth building. Uh, so as you can imagine, we are dealing with a lot of data of different nature. It's mostly unstructured text uh, coming from document files, video transcripts, but also we deal with uh, support conversations and reviews and so on. Um, our backend is mostly closure, pretty much all of it. We have some Ruby or Rails serving our front end and our client side applications within TypeScript and React and all the normal stuff that you would find. So the history of our stack is quite relevant um, because that's where we basically will be arriving at why Docula came into existence. So we started with a simple Ruby on Rails app, which was using RabbitMQ for just distributing the work uh, to happen in the background. At some point, we had to start adding natural language processing features, namely sentiment analysis and topic inference. And we couldn't find good tools to do that in uh, Ruby. So someone threw out an idea, well, why don't we just try Clojure and some JVM libraries? And after a very successful uh, implementation, we decided to actually get uh, and, and move ourselves to Clojure and move our backend to Clojure, no new features were written in Ruby, and we successfully migrated off our, at this point, legacy uh, Ruby code base to be basically fully uh, Clojure on the back end, backed by Postgres and Elasticsearch. We used to have RethinkDB somewhere in the mix, but that, luckily we, we managed to shut it down a few months ago. So now we are running around 10 Clojure services of various size. There's the Rails app that I mentioned and our TypeScript front end. And all of those components talk to each other in various ways, either asynchronous through RabbitMQ or synchronous using good old HTTP and JSON. So our asynchronous processing is fairly standard. We do fetching of the data from third-party sources, preparing data to be exported into CSVs or PDF files. We do batch operations triggered by our users. Uh, we do uh, automation processing, something like assign this tag if these phrases uh, appear in the document. We also convert files uh, from Word into our own proprietary format. We do email sending, you name it. They're basically all the things that have to happen at some point. They don't have to uh, happen right now whenever a user requests them. On the other side, we have the things that absolutely must happen now, like searching for documents, editing content, 
doing any of the classification, like assigning tags, also discussions that happen on the documents that has to happen in real time. Anything that the user is doing right now uh, that has to has the expectation of happening right now has to happen in, on our synchronous processing. So was we were building out our closure backend and the number of services uh, was experiencing growth, uh, we came up with this library we called it Robin because all our services are na named after comic book characters. So Robin is the best sidekick and it was used for uh, effectively providing this base for creating new services. And we didn't quite get it right. It, it did everything. It, it had toolkit for backend services, clients, RabbitMQ consumers and producers, some utilities, encryption handling, and so on. So it, it didn't work. Uh, as we were adding more and more code, it was very hard to keep up uh, maintaining that the kitchen sink just got way too big. So we decided to split it and effectively Robin has been deprecated for a couple of years now. And then some parts of it still live in some of the older services that we don't have to touch. Uh, as an effect of that, we have built our own framework since it's a bigger than just a library for defining RabbitMQ consumers and publishers and uh, it was our third iteration of, of such a library. It is very robust because it has to provide the guarantees that we need for safety in terms of making all the messages uh, written durable. We have to handle retries, uh, timeouts. We have to be able to spin up multiple threads to, for, for processing jobs and balance consumers and so on. A lot of that also we need the need to see the, the system metrics and standardized logging to, to see what's going on in the system. And as we are also expanding our closure usage, we have uh, adopted Stuart CRS components to, to just give a bit more structure into um, uh, our applications. And lastly, uh, Banicula supports uh, pluggable serialization. So we started with JSON to make it easier to inter integrate Rails with the closure services, but eventually that became a bit of a nightmare as the number of, of queues grew. Uh, so we switched to Avro to define very strict messages uh, for publishers and for consumers so that we always know what's being sent on the wire without uh, having this written contract. This is enforced on, on publishing level. So if there is an invalid schema uh, for a message, uh, then uh, the publisher will fail and an invalid message will not make it to the queue. So I mentioned Avro. Uh, it's a very, very simple and very nice data serialization format. Uh, its main use was for big data systems such as Cassandra but it's actually very broad. It, what it can do is it can serialize your data using a known schema, I think, then it can be deserialized in a different language. Um, it's very efficient. It has a broad use uh, across the, the whole industry. Apache Kafka is pretty much forcing you to use Avro for a lot of uh, uh, what you use it for. So we, we gladly adopted it, especially that it plays very nicely with Clojure as it doesn't require a compilation step. The schemas can be defined in JSON files or can be actually defined just as plain maps in Clojure and, and uh, can be shared across languages and do not require a compilation step like protocol buffers, for example. One of aspect that was quite important for us, schemas can be recursive. We do have some recursive data structures that we use for encoding our uh, the document content that we store, so having that safety on on like a transport level was was a very nice addition. So we have a pretty good story for how we are doing asynchronous processing, and, and we are quite happy with it. Bonicula has been very very stable. I think for the last two years we didn't make that many changes to it anymore. It's it's processing millions of jobs uh, all the time, and then uh, if anything goes wrong, it's our own business logic the, the underlying library is incredibly solid. However, the synchronous processing part is not get that good. Um, we run into a lot of issues because we had very little guidance on how to build the APIs that support our front end or other services. Um, uh, early on, we tried to make everything restful. So we would have these debates about how to structure the paths and, and the routes. Uh, should we use post or put for a given resource? How do we express certain operations such as create a document with seven tags? Is that do we call document post documents? And then we do another call to add the tags. Can we send everything in one payload? How do we get the tags from that document and so on? Uh, we run into a quite funny um, 
problem with casing. Sometimes the APIs will return kebab case. Sometimes they would return the snake case. So it was a bit of a mess. Our front end engineers were not happy with that. We originally we started using prismatic schema for validation, but that would be enforced on let's say a model layer, not necessarily on the request layer. So we would double validate everything. There was a lot of mess basically in it. You you could think about it as a a real organic growth, but not in a good sense. So we were always putting it off, fixing it because we had to move fast and, and iterate on the product itself. So this general lack of consistency always meant that if someone had to jump in and to fix a service they haven't worked on in a while, a lot of time was spent figuring out, okay, how are things done here? Um, another effect of that was we didn't have very good visibility into what the services are doing. Logs were always written whenever someone remembered about them. Metrics, we kind of tried to instrument our APIs, but we will get like very messy metric names, not very aligned to, to see the visibility, to, to have the visibility into the whole system. So all those things have this higher uh, requirement, which we fulfilled with Banicula, but we couldn't do on the synchronous uh, part, processing part, which is about the safety and correctness. So we always require validation of both inputs and outputs in our services, uh, but it was always very hard to add because there was no guidance about it. So we wanted to build something or use something that wouldn't make us think how to implement those things. We are not scared of types. I think we, they're okay, but they only matter at the edge of, of the system, which is uh, HTTP request handler or uh, so if we are calling a third party API, we want to make sure that we always get the same data and so on. And lastly, we wanted to use something that would allow us to gradually adopt it rather than force us to rewrite each service just so that we can have all those benefits. So we had to write our own library. Uh, I totally agree with that tweet. I think we need more Spider-Man 2 uh, movies. So that's how Dacula came came about. As you can see, the name is inspired by Banicula. Uh, fine. It doesn't really matter who it's called. It is a framework. It's not a library. It does force you to use it in a very specific way. Um, it only does HTTP at the moment. It can talk JSON uh, or Avro. Uh, it has built-in validation using the, the Avro schemas that I mentioned before. It does not support any sort of routing. Uh, an endpoint is, is mapped to a path, and that's about it. It doesn't support any parameters within paths, nothing like that. It's post only. so whatever inputs you're sending to a service uh, or to an endpoint, they have to be included in the post data as JSON. There is no query parameters, none of that. It comes with automatic metrics support, standardized logging, and also can generate Swagger or open API definitions and even come with a bundled viewer. So you can deploy a service and see what it's doing and read the documentation. So of course it's open source. So, Brief intermission to talk about Ring because it will be relevant to the latter parts. So Ring is a, as you probably know, is a is a web applications library uh, that allows that abstracts HTTP operations and handling. So it's very simple as compared to other languages. We have a handler which is just a function that returns a re re receives that fun request map, and then the request map has basic information about the request contents like headers, body, path, and so on. And then the handler returns a response or a function that can process the uh, the response or the request. And that allows us to build middlewares, which are just functions returning functions. So a simple example of a middleware would be a function that accepts the handler function, wraps it, and logs before and after the process is, uh, processing finishes and then returns the result so that the ring compatible server can just take that and run with it. And our handler is very simple. We just extract the body from the request and then echo back the, the name uh, included in the body. We are assuming that we are dealing with JSON here. Uh, and then we can combine it in the handler by wrapping the original handler with the middleware. That's 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 all it is. So coming back, all those safety guarantees that we wanted and also improving the productivity and shredding it out all the mess that we had uh, created a lot of convention over configuration because the HTTP support, post is supported uh, we always know that the, all the parameters for a given request will be in the, the request body. We don't have to do uh, complicated routing. So looking up uh, a handler based on a path is all one because handlers are just in a hash map. 
uh, the validation is optional and we can share the schemas uh, between the clients and the servers. And best of all, schemas can also be documented on any level, including down to the field level. So we can have pretty detailed docs encoded within the application itself. Um, and then observability is nicely supported because we get all the request metrics, whether request was successful or not. Uh, we have standardized error formats, and most of it is config driven, except for the handlers themselves. And we solve the problem of casing. Uh, a given service can only do one of those. So you can do either snake case or kebab case. You cannot do both, so we never mix them together, which solves a lot of issues because we can just turn a switch and adapt uh, one style to the other if we have to. So I'm going to go to a short example of a very basic service. Um, don't worry if you cannot see it or, or you want to look up the code, you will be able to find it on GitHub and I will include the link in this presentation. So here's our handler again, very simple. You can not, you notice that we dropped returning headers, Dacula can handle that for us. Uh, so we just get the name from the body and then uh, reply with hello. This is the configuration I mentioned. It's doesn't support, doesn't show all of the options that we have, but it's the bare minimum. We give our API a name, which is important in the logs and metrics. We have a hello uh, endpoint. It uses the handler as the request handler. And then these two elements define the schemas for the request data. So in this case, it will be a rec, that's an ever schema defining a map, which has to have a name key of type, the value has to be a string. And then response is very similar. Uh, it's a map with the name, the key, only one key called message with also the type of string. That's that's all it is. Then we can just build a full on ring handler uh, with the provided middleware to handle JSON and build the actual handler function based on the config that we just defined. And finally, we create a component system and inject the monitoring layer, which I will talk about in a second. And that's it. Uh, the server implementation bundled in the in the example repository uses Jetty, but it can be anything can be HTTP kit or uh, Aleph or whatever you use. So a quick test, we can just ping the, the endpoint with a example end uh, payload that will be named Alice. Uh, you calling the hello endpoint with the application JSON type, and we get our response, hello Alice, as expected. Now, what happens if we pass the wrong data? Uh, things explode and we get a standard error message saying request failed. We get our lovely Avro error of the response could, input data couldn't be deserialized or serialized into Avro. And finally, some details about what actually failed. So you probably notice that uh, a lot of weird things are happening because we are posting JSON and getting JSON back. At the moment, the Avro schemas are only used for validation, kind of like you how you would use uh, Clojure spec or Prismatic schema. However, the, the service can be switched to talk exclusively Avro, so the inputs wouldn't have to be JSON, but there would be uh, Avro bytes, and you would get the bytes back as well. So going back to monitoring, it's it's just something that implements the monitoring protocol, and the requirements are pretty uh, simple. It has to record the timing of the request, uh, increment a counter when a request succeeds, when there's an error, as, as in like a business logic error, or if there's an exception, like a database connection error, and then also handle 404s in, in case someone is calling an invalid endpoint that doesn't exist. And lastly, there's a hook for reporting exceptions to your error collector of choice. We provided and, and open sourced our own production ready implementation, which uses StatsD protocol for metrics, uh, closure tools, logging for logs, and Rollbar for exception, exception tracking. You can just pull it in and just drop it into your component system and it will, that will automatically pick it up. So given all that we started getting a lot of nice observability perks. Right? All our services uh, can use the same dashboard template in Grafana. So we can see all the requests that are going through, how many we can group by a given request. We can see error rates per uh, endpoint and also track latency across those endpoints. It's incredibly useful for tracking performance issues and seeing things like uh, these are screenshots from our staging uh, Grafana deployment. So there's not that many requests coming through, but we can see that some of them take off almost a second. This is a 95th percentile latency, so pretty bad as far as closure goes, but hey, it's probably running on a tiny 
uh, machine somewhere in Amazon. Lastly, Swagger documentation can be turned on. Uh, it's an opt-in option because you probably don't want to ship your API documentation to production unless it's a public API. So we give you uh, that as an option. I think something that can be enabled um, if you choose to. Um, and we also bundle the API. So you can just navigate to the URL and you can browse the documentation, including all the doc strings contained in the Avro schemas and browse them using the standard Swagger UI. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, and it's definitely not something that you can just drop into your project. It does come with certain uh, conventions and things that it forces on you. And it, it is like, as the, the screenshot says, I we did solve a lot of human issues of communication by just <laughs> forcing them through a technology. And it actually worked out pretty well. Uh, now we only focus on working on the business logic. We don't have to bike shed a lot of things as before. And, and all the effort goes into a centralized library rather than reinventing the wheel over and over. We did consider not building anything ourselves. We did look at things like Composure API, um, which looks the most promising, is the most fully featured. But because we have the requirement of sharing the schemas between different languages, uh, that was a non-starter for us. And we could probably use it kind of like we use Docula and just ignore all the Composure parts of params and all that stuff, but still uh, it, it, we will have features that we don't need and we pref prefer to have a smaller core uh, library that does only one thing very well. Uh, things like gRPC, Thrift, or Avro RPC, uh, they were a non-starter for us because none of them actually can be used in like a web context. It will be very hard to, to force our TypeScript frontend to start talking to over gRPC, for example. I think there is a web proxy, but it's uh, pretty basic. And of course, protocol buffers and thrift require a compilation step and they do, do code generation. So that was a non star for closure. It would break a lot of the workflows that we already have. Um, there were some co internal conversation about using GraphQL for the read path. And it's something we are definitely looking into. We, this is not a big problem for us right now. And we can still adopt it. And there's nothing going against mixing a Docula style RPC API for, for mut mutating calls, and then just the read path could go through GraphQL. It will work uh, pretty much in the same way. Um, but it would require a substantial rewrite on our part. The, the whole front end already is kind of built around all the RPC style APIs. So it will be pretty big investment. Lastly, there's something called Twerp that came out of Twitch. And I wish I knew about it earlier. It's effectively an equivalent of Docula, but written in Go and with a pretty strong Python support. Uh, and But rather than Avro, it allows communication over protocol buffers or JSON. So a lot of the design decisions are very much the same. And a lot of arguments for why would you like to use something like Docula also apply to Twerp. And I um, recommend reading the announcement blog post. I only found out about it two months ago, even though it was out for over two years. So it's quite funny. Maybe they didn't do a good job at advertising it. So let's talk trade-offs. Uh, no uh, perfect software, um, so we have to work around some of the the things that come with with the software that we use or we build. But also, it's about what is our use case and what problems we are addressing. So uh, we try to build something that that works for us, even though it's not ideal. Uh, there are some interesting trade-offs around not using any other HTTP method, but post. Uh, get, for example, can be nicely cached. We can set some caching headers and get responses that don't believe it's possible in post. Uh, the flip side is that the services can control the caches and they can invalidate them and update them whenever we need to. So we are not at the whim of the web browsers doing some weird uh, caching for, for certain resources and so on. Uh, there is definitely a performance hit for validating everything uh, all the time. But at this point where we are, the safety and correctness is just more of a concern for us. So we are take, willing to take that hit in order to ensure that we do not uh, cause some backend errors. Um, Avro itself can be problematic. The, the schema is quite simple to build. The, the language gets some takes some time to use to, but eventually it feels pretty natural. Um, but it cannot express complex conditions like this this property has to be a string, but it cannot be a, cannot be blank. Those things will have to be left to the business logic. And lastly, the errors generated by Avro are 
definitely not useful. Uh, cannot write data as schema is probably the most common one, but once you start dealing with recursive schemas or deeply nested ones, it gets worse, uh, which is something that we get used to as closure developers, I guess. We can get, get over that. So what is the roadmap for Dacula? It's been used in production for at least six months, if not more. I actually don't remember, but it's pretty widespread in, in our backend. Um, we do not have open source support for the Avro, pure Avro communication. It's something that one of some of our backend services do already, and we are trying to extract that part and made it uh, as part of uh, Dacula. So that's definitely coming. Uh, the Swagger generator is very, very fresh. So it's definitely not, uh, you know, it doesn't do all the things that we wanted to. It, it does miss the field level documentation, but it's something we can definitely add. And it's uh, the, the way it works at the one is a bit of a hack because it builds on top of Ring Swagger, which uses prismatic schema. So we convert our schemas into prismatic schemas. And that is just the code is a bit complicated for what it is. I would like to uh, sidestep that part and just generate the, the Swagger JSON directly from Avro. And lastly, Ring 2 compatibility. It's something that's still in the works. The, the proposal is out for the new Ring spec. Uh, but Dacula at the moment just works with the standard Ring 1 uh, specification. And as soon as the version 2 is, uh, is finalized, we'll, we'll work on adopting it. But as it is, it's, it's not pl even planned yet. So thank you for, all the, for your attention. Here are all the links that you might need uh, for this presentation. And I would like to thank uh, Metosin for, for open sourcing Ring Swagger. It was incredibly useful in building the Swagger support in Dacula and, of course, Ring being such a flexible uh, API allowed pulling off something quite complicated as this and abstracting all those things that need to happen in the request processing in our backends. Thank you. And I will be more than happy to answer all your questions.